I went out and I got a job. I was cutting grass. I was mowing hay. I was doing anything I could do. I was painting stuff. I was doing whatever I could to earn a couple bucks because I wanted a puppet like that guy on TV. Yeah. One day I was mowing a yard. I ran over a tennis ball. And it popped out the other side of the mower and had a big cut in it. I noticed if I squeezed it just right, it looked like a mouth. I took it home. I put some eyes on it. That was my first puppet. You want to see him? Yeah. He's at home. <laughs> he is. He's sitting up on my shelf in the office. He's nasty looking now. Oh, he is, man. He, woo. He's, he, I got one kind of like him. You want to see him? Yeah. yeah. is Mr. Wilson. That's right. Wilson is the name. That's right. And you can't get it wrong because it's tattooed on his butt right there. <laughs> Boy, did that hurt. <laughs> yeah. oh, Tell him about yourself. Really? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. I'm a tennis ball. I, I know. But, but you've had a great career. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You've played tennis all over the world. Oh, yeah. Yes. You've played with all the great tennis stars. No, no, no. You have it? No, they played with me. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> that is true. Oh, yeah. Well, well, tell them about your great career. You played every... Oh, yeah, I had a great career, and then one day it all ended. Tragically. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what happened? Well, we were in the middle of the tennis match. And I got hit upon the roof. And I couldn't get down. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> there I laid on the hot roof in the hot sun for days and days and days. And I couldn't go anywhere. And I was stuck. Aww. I love you. <laughs> And then it started to rain, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and it rained, and I got washed off the roof. That's good. No, it's not. It's not? No. Down the gutter I went out into the yard, and then some idiot ran over me with a lawnmower. <laughs> Hello, welcome to Land and Live. My name is Landon Harvey, and today we have ventriloquist Ken Groves. Ken, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Ken, how did you become a ventriloquist? Uh, I was forced into it at gunpoint. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was watching the Ed Sullivan show uh, about okay. 1968 and saw a ventriloquist. So I went to the library and got all three books. Back wow. then, there was only three books on it. That was it. And mm -hmm. I read the three books and went, I can do this. What's the big deal? It, it's a God-given gift, I have no doubt, because I could always do it. And yeah, yeah. so then I, I uh, you know, watched uh, the ventriloquists, you know, on the Ed Sullivan show and said, mm -hmm. oh, okay. You know, and I've been doing it ever since. Wow. That's great. When did, uh, so you also, you do ventriloquism and you also make cars, is that correct? Or you deal with cars somehow? Yeah. Yeah, it's a hobby that got way out of control. And, How'd that come uh, into the picture? Did, well, well, I always did that. My dad was a okay. welder and he had a shop and they would bring in old cars and, and want dad to fix them. And dad would make us cut out the bad stuff and make the patches and then he would weld them in and we'd have to clean it all up and we'd have to paint it and he would get paid and we would go to dad and go hey we did all the work and he'd look at us and go you got clothes on your back 
Did you eat today? <laughs> You've got a place to sleep. Shut up and get back to work, boy. <laughs> so they messed you know, the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I was about 10 years old. And then when, when I got into high school, everybody brought their cars to me to make them run and to fix them up. And uh, it's something I've done all my life. And then now it's we've had cars come in from like eight or nine different states that we've totally redone and rebuilt and made wow. custom cars and yeah and uh, restored old cars and built hot rods built cars from nothing just some plans on some paper and ended up with uh, cars that you know and sold them and and traded them and did whatever with and now I don't have time to build my own anymore because I'm doing uh, cars for other people all over wow well, that's that's phenomenal. Um, I said er earlier on our on our post here on our live post, I said comment your questions for Ken Groves. And our first question is from Chuck Lyons, and he's asking, "Is Ken awake?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chuck, I love you, man. And uh, Chuck is a great guy that helps us out at the convention and that. And uh, he's always there if we need help for anything. Chuck is a good guy. And yeah, it's it's almost past my bedtime, Chuck, but I am awake. So you you help set up the convention every year, is that right? Yeah, Mark and I started doing the convention in 2000. Okay. And, um, and Mark and I got together and brought the convention back because it had dropped for a year or so there. I went out and helped Valentine Vox do the first convention in Vegas. And that was a huge success out there. Yeah. And got Paul Winchell to come to that one. Um, Jerry Lane. Uh, the, an old buddy of mine, and I called Jerry and said, Jerry, we need Paul at the convention in Vegas, whatever it takes, let's get him there. And Jerry talked to Paul, they were old friends, and mm -hmm. finally convinced Paul to come to the convention. And uh, we had a great time and got to sit around and talk with Paul for quite a few hours at the convention, and we, we had a lot of fun. It was a great memory. Wow. That is, that is phenomenal. So, did your did your main market as a ventriloquist change as you progress through your career? Where did you start and where have you where have you ended up up now? Well, I, I started out doing uh, the church basement shows, mother okay. daughter banquets, father son banquets, mm -hmm. uh, any type of potluck dinner they would have or whatever. And then from there, I started doing festivals and fairs. And then I went into school shows. I worked with the Officer Phil program, creative safety products, uh, mm -hmm. for about five years, five or six years. Worked there with uh, Phil Hughes and Bob okay. Carroll and a couple others, uh, uh, Michael Eakins and Mike McDade and uh, Steve Taylor. And all of us worked together back then, and we had a great time. That was probably the best time ever because we'd all sit around and come up with the new scripts for the next year. And and uh, then we started all going to the event convention together in 84, 85, somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, we got to hang out and, and then we'd all go our separate ways and work the school year. And then we'd come back in the summer and, and that and we'd make up the new programs for the next year. We, we just had a great time doing that. Wow. And then and after that, um, I got involved in, in opening act work with all the country music stars all through the 90s. We opened for all the country music stars. We opened for Garth Brooks before anybody knew who Garth was. That's before he had friends in low places. <laughs> and after he got those guys, it was a whole other story. How did but you we, get into that? How did they find you or did you find them or how was uh, that? I was doing some fair work and doing a lot of fairs and stuff like that. And one of the big agents in the fair uh, industry came up to me, wanted to know if I would go over and do an opening bit for this guy that was on the big stage that night. And I went over and it was a country music guy, um, Charlie Daniels. And mm -hmm. uh, I did an opening act for Charlie Daniels and he really liked it. And we got to sit on his bus and talk a while. And I probably opened for Charlie four or five more times in the next 10 years. And from that, then I just started opening for a bunch of them all over the place. Um, private, uh, big private uh, venues uh, with these people to state fairs to whatever. And uh, Was this in your 20s or further on or earlier? Or? I'm sorry? 
what what age were you when you started when you started opening for these country music acts? Oh, I was uh, I was in my thirties. Okay. Yeah, because I started doing this full time. Uh, I think I was about twenty eight or twenty nine mm-hmm. when I started doing this full time. Did you ever consider and, a different career path, or did you, ventriloquism just kind of call your name in comedy, or what was well, that like? I, I actually had a, a great job with United Parcel Service. I was a master mechanic for United Parcel Service, and I rebuilt their wrecked trucks. And then a drunk driver hit me and disabled me. And I didn't work for about nine months. And I was sitting there in the recliner, and my hand was taped to a soccer ball because it, it tore up my right hand. And everywhere I went, my hand had to be above my heart. So everywhere I, I had an eyelet screwed into the ceiling with a string with a hook. And then there was an eyelet on the soccer ball and I'd hook it up. So I just sit there and hang my arm from the ceiling. I had oh. one above the bed and one above the recliner and one above the kitchen table. And everywhere I went, I had my hand hanging from the ceiling. And I did that for about nine months. And then I went through about three months of therapy after that to get my arm and my hand to work again. And yeah. during that time, I said, what else can I do? You know, I, yeah. <laughs> and right. so the ventriloquism started to become what I did. And mm-hmm. then it just kept up from there. And they told me I would never work on cars again. And I took about 20 years off and then got back into it again. And it just, thank God for it right now, or I'd started it up. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it's been really good. And I can do it now with no problem in that. So I have See, an actual, I have a bionic hand is what it is. It's all metal and bionic hand. So. Has that ever become a difficulty in performing your ventriloquist figures or characters? No, it, it's no. been a hassle getting through a lot of the airports, though. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, it's the puppet. You're like, no, it's my hand. <laughs> right, and a lot of them don't believe it. I have to stick my hand into the thing and beep, beep, beep. Oh, man. Beep, beep. Okay, it's your hand. Get out of here. You know, and yeah. so that's. Wow. Did you ever, how did you, how did you balance doing, working on cars and doing shows? I mean, later on, as you, as you took cars back into the, how did that kind of become? Well, when I was on the road a lot, when I was on the road a lot, you know, I'd be gone three, four or five weeks at a time. I'd come home and I'd have a couple weeks off. So Mm -hmm. I would go to the garage and play with my stuff. I would build stuff for me and tinker with my stuff. And then, uh, after I quit traveling so much and touring so much and started doing stuff closer to home and started with the theater seven, eight years ago, I started with the theater. Uh, then I started doing stuff for other people and that really has taken off. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's been a great second career. Mm-hmm. So you went from performing shows just around town to to the opening for these country music acts or did you do, had you done other venues? Like, uh, well, you did, no, of course I, you did the I fairs did, as well. Yeah, I had done a lot of uh, fairs and festivals. Uh, mm-hmm. I used to do all the comedy clubs back in the days of the improvs, uh, mm-hmm. laugh factories, laugh stops, all that. We used to do all kind of uh, comedy club work all over uh, cruise ships. We did uh, 600 and, or yeah, 625 cruises in about, 15 years, uh, 20 years, something like that. 625, and, you know, man. Yeah, that was too many. <laughs> Way too many. <laughs> but sometimes we'd do two a week, and, you know, it was just every every week or every other week I'd be on a cruise again. And then when I was home, I'd play in the garage or do some county fair stuff or some state fair stuff here and there. And yeah. so it just, we were constantly working, you know. Wow. Did you know, I'm, I'm curious because you've, you started up in all these different venues performing for all different types of audiences. Did your comedy have to morph to fit each audience or did you learn who you were as a comedian and how did your characters change throughout that? It, it's regional. Okay. In, yeah. The different regions have a different sense of humor and you have to learn that and understand that. Um, if you're way up northeast, they they're different than way down south, mm-hmm. um, and that's different than out west. 
And so once you learn those things and you, you figure that out, then you can do stuff that those people can relate to. Um, and it's just something that experience teaches you and you have to learn. But then I also tried to have material that was general material, stuff okay. that everybody could relate to. Mm -hmm. And that always helps too. Sure. And, and of course, as you grow, as you get older, as you do more and more stuff, hopefully your act grows. <laughs> hopefully you, right. you come into your own and can you have your own voice then uh, mm -hmm. as a comedian. And that's very important too. You know, I, I, in my years, I've seen a lot of acts. They had their half hour, 45 mm -hmm. minutes, and in 25 years, it never changed. And that, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good at all. Yeah. You, you need to develop your own personality and your own voice and put that into the act and um, create your own material. And, you know, and experience teaches you that. Definitely, definitely. Looking back at the comments, uh, Dale Brown is watching. He just joined us and he said, nice to see <laughs> that Ken learned how to tell time. <laughs> I had a senior brain fart, man, I'll tell you. And then, my, I, am, I am just senile, I'll tell you, I'm senile. But I, we got it, we got it. And then he said, Ken, I ordered a C8. I suppose you know what that means. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The new Corvette. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Dale, Dale loves his Corvettes, and uh, I'm trying to get Dale to come down here and play in the shop for a while, you know, but I'm afraid he, I think he doesn't want to get his hands dirty, you know, we're going to have to get him down here and get his hands dirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, out of out of your career of performing for all different markets and for different ty audience types, do you have a favorite story that comes to mind? We've had some very interesting things happen over the years. Okay. Uh, one night we were performing in a comedy club um, or a uh, country club, big yeah. country club, big event, had the big chandelier in the middle of the room and it's in the summer and somebody was going in and out of the door and a bat came in and a bat was flying around the room and around the big chandelier. The ladies were squealing and screaming and carrying on, and the show came to a screeching halt. Everybody was in a panic. Nobody knew what to do. I picked up a tennis racket, whack, killed the bat. And then everybody got mad at me and was yelling at me. <laughs> and the show ended, and it was over. And it was like one of those nights, no matter what, you couldn't win and, and just go home, you know. And uh, so that was a very interesting one. And then one night on a cruise ship, I was in the middle of the show and I kind of caught a glimpse of glitter. Now, what is that glitter coming down from the ceiling? What is that glitter? I see glitter. And just about that time, the ceiling fell in on the one side and was clear full of water. And all the water come, got 10 or 12 of the seats. And I mean, just, just soaking wet. And here, one of the big water lines had burst in the ceiling and filled the ceiling up with water and it all caved in and all the water come Oh and man. Of that <laughs> oh, and some very interesting times um, uh, throughout the years doing this. And it's hard to believe it's, it's gone so fast. You know, mm -hmm. 30 plus years just in a blink of an eye. It's just been amazing. Wow. Would you have done anything different if you could go back? If, yeah, yeah, I believe I would specialize. Okay. I did a lot of um, corporate stuff. I did a lot of trade shows. If I could go back and do it over, I think I would concentrate more on the sh uh, trade show market. It pays very well. Mm -hmm. uh, you do custom material about the product that you're selling. And it, it was a lot of fun. And we had a very good time with it. And we sold garage doors for Wayne Dalton Garage Door Company. Okay. And now looking back, I wish I would have said, give me a dollar for every garage door that I sell. I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was a good time. But I think if I had to go back, I would specialize in mm -hmm. a particular field or two. 
Um, that way you become a master. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was jack of all venues, you know, but really not a master of any of them because you would do a trade show this day, a corporate event that day, a county fair this day, a school show this day, uh, an opening act uh, deal for uh, somebody. And, you know, yeah, I, I did okay. Yeah, I did okay. But I think if you focus and you become the master of one or two markets, it, it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what was what was your thought process behind that? Because that it, it it's interesting to hear that you that you'll do a bunch of different. You used to do a bunch of different venues each week. How how did that go about? Did you say, "Oh, well, I'm going to start in school markets," and then after you're like, "Oh, I need to try something else here," and I'll add in the corporate market or? Did it just kind of happen organically? I well, no. I wanted to try a little bit of everything to see what I liked, okay. and then I was going to go back and pick one or two. But mm -hmm. you know, when you have little kids running around, you have a mortgage to pay for and a car to pay for, and uh, you know, kids wanting to go to college and stuff like that. You just start taking whatever comes in, and uh, and pays good, and so. Yeah. You know, when when the school shows kind of dropped off a little bit, the corporate market picked up. And when the corporate market dropped off a little bit, the trade shows picked up. And then when the trade oh, shows dropped off, the um, opening act work was going great and the fairs were going great. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it really all worked together and, and kind of just fell in place. And one picked up where the other one fell short. And so... Mm -hmm. I never really got to go back and and uh, pick the two most favorite ones I wanted to do, and uh, then come really concentrate on those. So today but you, I'm not, I'm not today you prefer, you know. sure, sure. Well, it's it's interesting. It's interesting to see how you started and then how that how that progressed throughout your career. Uh, can you tell everyone where you perform today, where you most of your shows? Uh, we're at the Amish Country Theater in Berlin, Ohio, and it is the biggest Amish settlement in the country. Um, and it's like 45 minutes from my house. And they have a lot of corporations down there. And okay. I have al always worked in that area in the corporate uh, deals down there. And so everybody knew who I was, and I knew who everybody was down there. And then back in 2012, I got a call to come to this theater down there and do a, a special show. And the thing sold out in about three hours. And they had never had a sellout at the theater. It was a brand new uh, venue. And right. they, they hadn't had a sellout. And so the night of the show, I went down, did my show. We had a lot of fun, a great time. Mm -hmm. And after the show, the guys that had set the theater up came to me and said, can you stick around and help us? We uh, don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we have no idea about a show. And I said, well, let me see your show. Let me watch your show. And then mm -hmm. we'll talk. And I watched their show and it was, <laughs> it was a lawsuit festival is what it was. And really? Uh, they, oh, they were doing a lot of things that just you cannot do. And uh, once, you know, you start selling tickets to the public and you're taking clips from uh, Barbara Walters and you're taking clips from American Idol and stuff like that and putting it on the big screen and you're interacting with it. You're not allowed to do that. Yeah, <laughs> and they had no idea, and I had to fill them in and all that, and some of the other stuff they were doing was just not good. And I've been with them ever since, and helped grow them, and helped uh, uh, grow the theater. And then we uh, built our new big theater and hotel and event center, and all of that. Uh, two years ago, we moved in, and so that's. Oh, okay. It's been something. So that's a completely, that's, is that an add on to the original location or is that something totally separate? Yeah. Okay. No, this is a total new location. Wow. We were in a big warehouse and we built the theater inside the warehouse. And then we uh, got the opportunity to pick up eight acres uh, there in Berlin. And mm -hmm. so we, we got those eight acres and then we built the uh, 81 room hotel, the big event center and the 600 seat theater. Uh, three separate buildings all connected together. 
and that worked out real well for us. And now we're sitting here wondering what we're going to do with this whole Corona thing, you know, and, uh, and that, and we got to get our season open. We got to get going here because the, the bill for that is big. And, uh, so we're we're hoping we can get that up and running here before too long yeah or we may not have the theater so we'll see yeah so i'm I'm curious do you guys have rotating acts and then some staple acts to the to the location or how does that how does that work when you're hiring outside entertainment a, or? we have a group of six of us and we okay. put the shows on we have a great singer uh okay. this year we have uh niels dunker uh coming in yeah. he just left the comedy barn his contract was up there we hired him for this year and mm -hmm. he's come on board and then there's me and we got a hillbilly character uh uh that is a stand-up comedian and a great uh actor and okay. so we do uh, a lot of sketch comedy and then when Niels will do 10 minutes the singer will do uh, a couple different sets i'll do uh, 10 minutes in each half um Leonard, our hillbilly character, he'll do a stand-up bit, uh, 10 or 12 minutes, and then he'll do some sketches in each half of the show. And then every year we change up what we do and we, we build stuff. We have a group of Amish, we have two Amish guys in the show, the Jonas Brothers, and uh, they do parody songs. And the one guy okay. writes some amazing parody songs. And so they do those parody songs uh and then we change up uh what i'd like to do in the future is bring in an act uh and then maybe have them there for a month and then they would go away and then we bring in another act and we sure. do that uh like that i mm -hmm. i would like to grow it into that uh um, yeah. it'll be another couple of years before we can do that though wow. but we're, i would like it to go in that direction Oh, that's great. That's super neat. So when you when you had first entered uh, the Amish Country Theater and you had seen it with this just lawsuit waiting to happen, how did you go about changing it from that to what it is today? And is it like everything that they change or uh, they might add on, it goes through goes through you and, and you know, Ken, Ken Grove signs off on it? I mean, what's the, what's well, the process no, like? No, that? We, I had to sit down and explain to them why this is good, why this is bad okay um how this is so much better doing it this way mm -hmm. and then you know it was like 101 theater 101 how to come on stage how to leave stage um how you always want to present to the the audience um and once they started learning that and they saw how the shows the attendance increased and the reviews increased and mm. stuff like that it, you know we would all sit down and we brainstorm the next show and and i they would all look at me and go is that okay is that okay is that how you know and i would say mm, well <laughs> you know <laughs> and uh, we would talk about it and i try to explain why or i would ask them what do you think about this and how do you think it's going to be accepted by the bus tours because we have about 300 buses come in a year and okay. uh, you know each each bus has 50 people on it and sure. you know how do you think they're going to take what we're doing and so you know, i started asking them questions and letting them answer the questions and you know it kind of helped them kind of get a clue of which way and how to make it roll and, and it sure. worked out real real well for everybody so so the so the audience is seats 50 or is it a smaller crowd or a larger larger crowd you said the buses are 50. Well, in the you know we'll have four or five buses in. In okay at, at one time plus the other people that come in, and mm -hmm. um, you know we on a matinee show we'd have uh, two to three hundred in there, uh, then the evening show we'd have anywhere from three hundred to five hundred in there, and okay. uh, it, yeah, it worked out real good. And we would do the shows on Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then we uh, Thursday we had just one show, but the other days we would have matinee shows. So, as a performing ventriloquist, did the how did the matinee shows help you uh, perfect your craft? Matinee shows can be tough. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be tough, but what you have to be is confident in your material. 
you know this material works. And if you don't get the reaction you want, that's okay. You know it's good material. We've proved that a thousand times, you know. Right. So it's not the material. Uh, it might be my presentation of that material, but I know the material solid. So what am I doing wrong? How am I? Is it, do I'm, am I going out there with an I don't care attitude and they picked up on that? Mm -hmm. Am I going out there with a cocky attitude and they picked up on that? Or is it just an afternoon bus crowd where they've just been on the bus for six and a half hours? and they just ate lunch and then you put them in a nice soft seat and you turn the lights down and they all went to sleep <laughs> and that happens you know sure, and sure. you yeah and you just have to understand the material's good i know it's good i've proven it uh for many years and uh, on many crowds and so it's not the material and mm. i feel i'm there in the right attitude and the right spirit and giving it a hundred percent so it's obviously a tired sleepy grumpy bus crowd right and you have those. Okay. and then yeah. it was so funny because then two hours later we would have the evening show and people would just go wild and we go see i told you the material was good <laughs> so i'm curious as a ventriloquist with characters do you use this th that same bit again that evening like how do you, or do you do a totally different bit that evening? What's your, what's your, uh, your lineup we, on that? We, we run two different shows in a week. Okay. We run a, a Tuesday, Friday show, and mm -hmm. then we run a Thursday, Saturday show. And the material in those two shows stays the same. And then you know, like on Tuesday, we'll do the matinee show at two and then the evening show at seven. The material is mm -hmm. all the same in that show. But then the other show is different material. And then we just run that for the year then. And the next sure. year we change up material or puppets or whatever. And I only do the uh, two different puppets. I do a, a puppet in the first half of the show and a puppet in the second half of the show. Or I'll do a puppet in the first half of the show and then maybe do the masks in the mm -hmm. second half. Or I've got a great big drawing board. I'll do a, a drawing board bit, or I'll okay. do um, the people puppet thing where I bring them up, tap them on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And so, and then some shows I just do one puppet in the first half and a different puppet in the second.